When we think about life, what generally comes to your mind? Many times we center around the news that we hear. What do we hear on the news right now? Riots, murdering, stealing. We hear of a government in which we think is failing. Did you notice anything good there? We hear of terrible news, sad news. We hear of news of children who are injured. We hear news of those who are older who are being abandoned. We hear news that just makes us sorrowful. We hear news in which makes us think, what in the world is going on? We get concerned. Sometimes that worries us because we're not sure exactly what's going on. We know that we're supposed to be living this Christian life and there is a Christian way in which we can be living in. And we know we're supposed to be living inside of that way. And when we think of this Christian life and when we think of this Christian way, sometimes we're discouraged. It may be all of the things that's happening in the world. It may be things that are happening right here in the midst of our community. But there's a question we have to ask. How do I keep going in this Christian way? Everything that I hear is negative. Everything that I'm seeing in our world scares me, it concerns me, it makes me worried about living in this world. How many of you have said, I I fear for the generation to come? I've heard that many times. But how do we keep going? I'm not asking the question, how does the future generation keep going? Or how does the generations of today keep continuing until they're gone? How do we all, at no matter what time in which we live, no matter what age in which we're living in, how do we keep going? And how do we live that Christian way? Turn with me to John 16. I want us to notice two verses before we get into our passage of consideration that help us understand what's preparing to happen in the book of 1 Peter. But John 16, and I want us to begin at the verse 33. John 16, verse 33. We find here, These things I have spoken unto you, that you might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. That should be an encouraging passage, at least in reading. Jesus stating He's overcome all the world. That means all the fears, all of the doubt, all of the wrongs, all of the sinful nature, all of the sadness and sorrow. He's overcome it. But I find that verse very interesting when we go back to the very beginning of this chapter. Go back to John 16 and notice verse 1. I find it interesting here that we we read, These things have I spoken unto you, that you should not be offended. Isn't that interesting? The end I've overcome. In the beginning, these things I'm speaking, and I have spoken unto you, that you will not be offended. It's very interesting to me, at least, that the word offended means to, to trip up, to cause one to stumble, to cause one to fail. It's a beautiful depiction here as we end the chapter of chapter 16 in John. I have overcome the world. I've not come here so you'll be offended, so you'll trip, so you'll slip, so you'll fall, so you'll fail. I've come and I've overcome the world so you could do the same. In the book of 1 Peter, we're going to find something interesting. 16 different times, the phrases about sorrow, about tribulation, about trials, is going to rear its head. Peter thus approaches those in which he's writing to to deal with the perils, the pressures, and the persecutions of life. 
And these are many of the things in which we deal with sometimes daily. So we have to ask ourselves the question, how did they do it? How did they survive? How were they found faithful? I think here's the more important question for us this morning. How are we found faithful? How do I, living in a world in which I consider to be dangerous, troublesome, worrisome, how do I survive? How do I keep my faith? How do I keep a good attitude knowing that Jesus has overcome the world and I have the opportunity to be with Him? Three things are going to happen in our passage this morning from 1 Peter 3, beginning in verse 12 and ending in verse 18, which was read for us just a moment ago. We're going to notice the Lord and His people. His people and their lives and their lives in His way. And what we're going to be able to do at the end of our discussion this morning is take these things that they were enduring, take these things in which they had to deal with sometimes on a daily basis, and apply it to me. So I can see how I, living in 2014, which is almost concluded, can keep on going. So I can see how I can live the Christian way in which is given. No one's ever said it's easy, but someone has given us a way in which we can do so. Uh, So let's begin by looking at the Lord and His people, our first point of consideration this morning from 1 Peter 3, 12 through 14. Uh, Let's just read those verses together so we have a fresh mind of what we're looking at. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and His ears are open unto their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. And who is he that will harm you if ye be followers of, the, of that which is good? But, and if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. When we begin to think about the Lord and His people, the very first thing we begin to see in verse 12 is there's a consideration that's coming on. There's a perspective that's presented. It's the perspective of the Christian. You see, when we think about Christians, we think about our outlook on life. It's different, isn't it? We know that at the end of our lives, if we are faithful, there's a home prepared for me. And we know that if we live unfaithful in this life, there is also somewhere prepared for me that is not what I want to be. So we know when we're thinking about life, only two ways in which I can live, only two paths in which I can travel, and there is a life in which I'm going to live. Yes, life may be dangerous. Life may be full of problems. You may even feel like your life is one problem after the next. But there is a way to overcome this. And we find it here in the perspective that's being given. Uh, Three things that come from this particular verse, and I want us to notice verse 12 in particular, with the Christian's perspective. And we begin at the first one. For the eyes of the Lord. The Lord can see. And we see this here. The Lord can see those that are His. But I want us to make the second contrast of what's being seen. The Lord can see those who become unfaithful to Him. Or as being described here in the passage, those that do evil. Both are being seen in this world. But read on the verse, for the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous. Which gives us the idea of the eyes of the Lord are concerned about. The eyes of the Lord are worried about. The eyes of the Lord are always searching for the righteous and goodness and blessings for them. And not only that, but the Lord can hear. And His ears are open unto their prayers. So we're noticing two things about the Lord right now. He can see, and He can hear. And His eyes are attentive unto those that are righteous, those that are faithful unto Him. And His eyes are turned away from those that are evildoers. Let's think about His ears for a moment. We've had two very wonderful prayers so far in our assembly this morning. Did you ever imagine that the ears of the Lord are in tune with those prayers? Let's take it back to our homes last night before we went to sleep. When you were praying before you laid your head down that night, have you ever thought that the ears of the Lord are attentive? They're not turned away so they cannot hear, but they're turned so they can hear every concern, every care, and... 
every petition in which we can bring to the Lord. So we're seeing the Christian's perspective. The Lord can see and hear those in which are faithful unto Him. But the Lord also can stand. We're finding something very specific. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. The Lord doesn't stand for evil. The Lord does not stand for sinful activity. The Lord does not stand for those that will not turn back unto Him. The Lord does not stand for those that will be with the one in which has overcome the world. So He can stand. The Christian, and we're thinking about the Christian's perspective coming from this particular thought of how I can live the Christian way. We have to couple Romans 8.31 here. Remember, the Lord can stand against those that are unfaithful, and the Lord can stand with those that are faithful. Remember Romans 8.31. Because we as Christians have the greatest example, or the greatest advantage. Romans 8.31 describes, What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? So there's a perspective the Christian has inside of his life, knowing that the Lord can see, he can hear, and he can take a stand, whether for right or for wrong, against it or for it. But not only that in our consideration this morning, there's the peace in which the Christian has. And notice verse 13 in 1 Peter 3. And who is he that will harm you if you be followers of that which is good? Peter's saying here unto us, there's no enemy, there's no army, there's no individual, There's no one that can do anything to harm you. Now that's perplexing to us, isn't it? Because we began thinking about the troubles, the trials, the persecutions of life, the sadness, the sorrow in which we hear each and every day. We began thinking about our newscast this morning. If you watched the news this morning, what did you see? Danger and despair in our world. But Peter's saying no enemy, no army, no individual can do anything to a faithful child of God that can provide lasting harm. Is it possible that we're going to be harmed in this world? Is it possible that my life today could be harmed in some manner? Is it possible in which my life could be ended today or my life could be stopped from different various things? Is it possible things in my life could be ripped from me by the dangers of this world? By those in which live in this world, as considered in verse 12, those that do evil. It's possible. But those things do not last. And that's a hard thing for the Christian to give. Because we're talking about the Lord and His people. And here His people are living in the midst of a world that's dangerous. A world in which sometimes we would describe with this word, scary. We don't use it very often. But our world can be scary. But there's nothing inside of this world that can do a lasting harm to me. Listen to Matthew 10, 28. Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. But rather fear him which is able to destroy both the soul and the body in hell. You see, there's nothing on this earth outside of myself, that's going to determine what I'm going to do and where I'm going to be eternally. Yes, there are dangerous things in our world. Peter's not saying, if you're a Christian, nothing can ever hurt you. But he's saying nothing on this earth can last eternally. Nothing can hurt you eternally outside of what you do in your life. So there's the peace in which we can have. The pain. Suffering of this world, it's only temporary. But let's notice verse 14. There's something else coming. There's the prosperity in which we have. Notice 1 Peter 3, verse 14. But, and if ye suffer righteousness' sake, happy are ye. And be not afraid of their terror, neither be ye troubled. How can we call that prosperity? When we think of prosperity, we generally think of wealth. We generally think of monetary gains. We think of things of people who prosper in their family, who have great families to live among them. We think of those who prosper in their jobs. They're rising up that corporate ladder. They're becoming more successful. 
We think about people who prosper in the social circles. They're becoming more popular. They're becoming more liked. But here we're talking about prosperity and suffering and how we can be happy in the midst of this. You know, godliness and righteousness is often opposed by ungodliness and unrighteousness. And that's what's being depicted here. But if you suffer for righteousness sake, notice what he says, happy are ye. Peter's not telling them here that they'll be painless. But Peter's telling them here there is a victory that can be won. There's something that can be had. There's a beautiful depiction here of what's happening. So what we're learning so far about the Lord and His people from 1 Peter 3, 12 through 14 is, I have a perspective, I have a peace, and I have a prosperity that can be given me. No one can take that from me. No one can strip that from me. Because our Lord came and He overcame the world. But let's notice His people and their lives, verses 15 through 16. Notice He's with me again. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and in fear. Having a good conscience that, that where is they speak evil of you, as of evildoers they may be ashamed that falsely accuse thee or you in, in Christ. When we're thinking about the Christian life and we're thinking about God's people in their lives and we're thinking about the question of how do we live in this Christian way, there's three things that come to our mind from this particular passage. Number one, there's a life of purity in which we can live. A life of purity in which we can live. Notice the very first two words of this verse. But sanctify. But sanctify. The word sanctify means to make holy. That is to purify or consecrate. To hallow. To separate apart. It also means to separate from profane things and dedicate it to God. So what we're learning here. In the previous section, there may be things that harm us physically, but they never last eternally. But I can sanctify myself, which means I can set myself apart. I can set myself separate and apart from the world. I can hallow myself. I can make myself holy. I love that depiction of taking something from corruptible to incorruptible. You know, when we become a child of God, we think about when we're buried in baptism, we're washing off the old man, and we rise up to put on that new man. We take off that old life, and we put on that new life. It's really complexing to think about that that's a continual action. That's something that I'm always doing. I'm always working to improve myself. I'm always working to better, better myself. And we find here, I can live a life of purity if I will sanctify myself unto the Lord. I think the question that's really being asked here in our minds is where's our heart? Where's our heart? And we can do this with an easy depiction. It's really easy for us to do right now and answer this question. Ask yourself the question right now, where's your heart? Is it with the Lord right now? Or is it somewhere else? Because where we're at this morning, right now, should be the easiest place for us to live. We're among fellow people that are trying to live the same life. We're trying to go the same Christian way. We're trying to encourage each other. We're trying to refresh each other. We're trying to live the same life. So this should be the easiest place for us. Where's your heart? Right now. Where's your heart? home this afternoon ask yourself the question where's the heart so we can find out where our we may be wondering what exactly is happening specifically with this and how we can live that and that's the harder question to ask you may be thinking, you're telling me I need to sanctify myself. You're telling me I need to separate myself. I need to set myself apart. 
You're telling me I need to live a life that's appropriate. How do I do that? That's the question. That's the verse 15. Always and be ready to or, and be ready always to give an answer to every you a reason of the in you with meekness, having a good conscience. Life in which we're looking at living here. There's a depiction of things we're looking at this morning. A life of knowledge. Verse 15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer. Have you ever contemplated giving answers? How do you know how to give an answer? I have to have the knowledge in which I can do such. I have to have an understanding in which I know what I'm saying is correct. How many of us like to give wrong answers? Someone asks us a question and we just say whatever's on the top of our head. We know it's not right. Does that make any sense to us? Doesn't make sense to us, does it? How many of you would like to know that your children ask questions at school and the teacher just makes the answer? Not worried about it. How many of you would like to know that in our Sunday morning Bible class a question was asked and an answer was just given? It wasn't right, but it was the best thing they could think of at the time. How many of you would like to know that someone's giving the wrong answer and that's okay? You see, when we ask the questions, we know right off the bat. We need to have the right answers. We need to have the appropriate life. And if I'm going to live the life of purity, if I'm going to live a life that's sanctified, that's set apart, I need to have the knowledge to be able to do so. That means I have to be ready. This means we're ready to make a defense. This means that I have a responsibility. And I want you to notice the rest of the verse with me because it answers what we're trying to do this morning. How do I live the Christian way? But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. That's part one. Part two, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. How would we answer the question? How were you saved? How would we answer the question, how do you know you're going to have a home in heaven? How do we answer these things? It's given to us here. And inside of these questions, we're getting a depiction of what happens in life. If I live a life of knowledge, it will help me sanctify myself, and it will help me separate myself away from the Lord, or away from the things of this world that bring me closer to the Lord. Under His people and their lives, purity and knowledge... That's easy to think of. But there's another thing I want us to think of real quickly. There's a life of pride in which is lived by the Christian. And generally when we think about pride, we say, oh, we should not be prideful. But we should be proud to be a child of God. We should not be ashamed of who we are as a people of God. And notice verse 16. Having a good conscience that... Whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, that they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversations in Christ. I should not be ashamed living in 2014 to be able to say these words. I am a Christian. That's something our world doesn't want us to say. But it's something we don't have to be ashamed of. It's something we can actually be proud of and we get the depiction here. I need to have a good conscience. Whereas if someone says something evil of me, they'll be the ones ashamed because that's not how my life is. I live my life because of my purity and my knowledge and that means I've separated myself. I'm living a life that God would have me to live. I'm not ashamed. That means I'm not ashamed to live the Christian life. You know, it's easy for us, and we've already talked about this, it's easy for us here. It's easy for us 
have clean speech. It's easy for us to do the correct things. It's easy for us to, to have the right manner of life in which we're supposed to have in the midst of worship. It's easy for us when we come on Wednesday evening to live amongst these people as we should. But we live in a world that's full of terror. We live in a world that's full of pain and sorrow. We live in a world, and we do not like to admit this, we live in a world that's full of sin. I'm not saying we're the ones that are sinful in the world. I'm saying we live in a world, we live amongst the people in which sin is okay. Now how do I react to that? I can't be ashamed. I cannot be ashamed to be a child of God. I can't be ashamed to do the right things. I can't be ashamed to do the right things when everyone else wants me to do the wrong things. I can't be ashamed when someone invites me somewhere on a Sunday or a Wednesday to be able to say, no, I must be at the services of my Lord. I must not be ashamed when different things come up in which we should be attending for the Lord to be able to say, why don't you come with me? And then we'll go do that. You see, his people in their lives are full of purity, they're full of knowledge, and they're full of pride. Because Jesus came not so we would be offended, not so we would stumble, but so we would have everlasting life because he overcame the world. Our third and final point this morning is their lives in his way. Notice verses 17 and 18 again. For it is better, if the will of God be so, that ye suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us unto God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. There's three things we need to notice from these particular passages here. Number one, there's the keeping of poise. You know what we're talking about when we say poise? How do I, how do I live my life? How do I present myself? How do I show myself? Is what I'm doing for me or for the Lord? Is what I'm doing here this morning for me or is it for God? Is what I'm doing in this world for me or for God? find in verse 17 there's the keeping of ourselves it may be the case it may very well be the case and it may be our future it may be everything that the world has to offer us from now on the writer here says it's better if the will of God be so that you suffer for well doing rather than evil doing Sometimes we have a hard time understanding this passage because it concerns us. Is that what my life's going to be full of? Is he saying that I'm going to suffer? Is he saying it's guaranteed that's what's going to happen to me? Those questions may be in your mind too. Is he saying that my future is not looking good? Is he saying that it's God's will for me to suffer? What we find in verse 17 is a depiction. A depiction of the Christian way. He's saying it would be better if it even is the will of God. If that's what God's will is for us. To suffer. But to suffer for good things rather than the sinful things. So it's an attitude in which we live. It's a way in which I can poise my It's a way in which I can stand in my life. I can know that no matter what I do, that the right way is always the right way. And no matter what comes from this, it'll be worth it one day. Verse 18 gives us a beautiful depiction of something as well in which we need to look at. There's the keeping of the soul. Here's the crux of the matter. Here's where we're trying to get to. How do I live this life? For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that He might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. There's the keeping of the soul found here in verse 18. 
when we think about salvation. We think about the fact that God has prepared for everyone. He has prepared for mankind, no matter who they are, no matter what social standings they're in, no matter how much money they have, no matter where they live upon this earth, no matter what nationality they've been, been raised, no matter what color their skin is, no matter what they've done in the past, but God has made it possible for your soul and for my soul to be saved. He's made it possible for you and me to be able to stand today and say, no matter what happens in this world, I can be with my Lord. He's telling us here that no matter what happens in the future and no matter what has happened in the past, there's something we can look into. All of our songs this morning have been centering upon the cross. And that's where we're finding ourselves here. We're asking ourselves the question about the Christian way. And here's the idea. Here's the thought. The Christian way is possible because, because of the cross. The just for the unjust. Let's think of ourselves for just a moment when thinking of this thought. Why did Jesus die upon the cross? I mean, what made, that, what made that a necessity? Generally, when we think of that question, we think of Genesis 1 through Genesis 5. There was sin in the beginning of the world. And we try to point that blame that because sin was brought into the world at that time, that's why God had to come. That's why God had to send His Son. That's why He had to die upon the cross. And that's why the cross exists. But let's put a pause on that thought for just a minute. I want you to think of this question, and I'm going to answer it myself silently. How many of us have sinned? How many of us have sinned? See, it doesn't matter what's happened in the past. It doesn't matter what people have come before us. We're asking the question, why did Jesus die on the cross? And the only answer we can come up with individually is because I have sinned and transgressed the law of God. And in doing such, I have separated myself away from God. That means there are people upon this earth just like me that have done some things that I have done, maybe done some things our world considers worse than me, but all have sinned to come short of the glory of God. So why did Jesus die on the cross? Because there were our people in which live upon this earth that have sinned. No matter what time we begin looking at that thought, and no matter what time we begin stopping at that thought, from beginning to the end of the world, there are people that live upon this earth that will sin. And that's you and me. So when we ask the question, why did Jesus die upon the cross? The answer is being given to us here in the keeping of the soul. Notice 18 with me again. For Christ also hath suffered for sins. The just for the unjust. I was the unjust. And He's the one that justified me. And He provides a way in which my soul can be kept. Have you ever thought about the cross of Christ? Have you ever thought about what kept Jesus upon the Sometimes we have the idea that it was the nails in which Jesus was driven to. And that's what kept him upon the cross. But I want to submit to you a different thought. It wasn't the nails that kept Jesus upon the cross. It was his love for you and me. And it was his love for mankind. It was his love for his creation because he knows That we need a way into heaven. He knows that we have failures and frailties. And we have Christ upon the cross and we must respond to His love. Their lives, which is His people and His way. So let's add one more thought to this and the lesson will be yours this morning. In the keeping of poise, the keeping of the soul, now the keeping of confidence. 
Notice with me again the ending of verse 18. The just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Have you ever thought about fear and what it does to a people? If you study the Old Testament very much, you're going to notice one thing that runs through the Old Testament. And that's fear. And you're going to notice as we're looking at all the different people, generically when we're looking at the people of God, one thing kept creeping into their lives. And one thing kept being right in front of their face. Fear. They were worried about the people in which they lived among. They were worried about the things in which the people that they lived around could do to them. They were worried about how giant and how mighty people could be. They were worried about how small they were. Worried about how small they were as a people. They were worried about how small they were as individuals. And fear set into their lives. I have some things on the screen for us. You know, fear should be a thing of the past. You know, oftentimes we say the statement that we need to learn from the past. We need to learn from history so we don't repeat the same mistakes that they made. When we take the Old Testament application of fear, how did they quit that fear? How was it that people were able to no longer fear the things of this world? The pressures of this world, the disasters of life possibly? We can think of several scenarios. Remember when the people were brought to the promised land and they sent those spies into the land? What happened when they came back? Fear. Ten of which said we can't do it. Two of which said we could. Now what overcame? Faith or fear? Fear. When it was later on after the children of God had wandered in the wilderness, what happened when they came into the promised land again? Remember, one stood up and said, God has given us this land and we can possess it. What happened to those people? There was no fear that time. There was only faith. And what did they do? They possessed that land. If we keep on going in the history of God's people in the Old Testament and we make our way down to the times of the prophets and the kings, what happened? Fear. When we think of certain individuals, inside of society that lived that time. Do you remember a king that lived in the Old Testament? Your mind may be going to multiples. But I'm going to describe him without giving him your name or giving, him, giving you his name. He was a man in which was fearful that the people of God in which lived under his rule would leave him. So he decided because of his fear, he'll set up two new places of worship in Dan and Bethel. And he'll institute this, he'll set priests over it, he'll take it under his wing, and he'll make it right so people could worship God. All of that was brought upon fear. And the Bible describes that man as he caused the people of God to sin because they had fear. We have something better than fear. We have faith. You know, faith really should be a part of our future. Have you ever thought about future and when the future begins? That's an interesting question. When does the future begin? Right now. Right now. We're asking the question, how do I live the Christian way? Here's how I do it. I have faith. Because it's a part of my future that begins now. So we've noticed three things this morning. All centering around the Lord and His people and what His people can do be better for the Lord. We've been pondering the question of the Christian way. We've been pondering the thoughts that may be in our minds. We may have wondered, thought, or pondered the question, how do I live the Christian life? I think we've noticed this morning that the Christian life may not be easy. I think we've noticed this morning that sometimes it may be easy. But what we've found so far is the Christian life is possible because God has sacrificed to make so. And it's our response unto the Lord's sacrifice that makes the difference. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus, sing His mercy and His grace. 
in the mansion's bright.